methods that we used in the garden because it's a small farm. We use a lot of the hand tools that you would use in a in a um, in a backyard garden at the farm, and vice versa. There's a lot of tools that we use at the farm that are are hand tools, but they're not readily available to gardeners. But you have to go to a, a garden a, a farm supply house, which I will talk about later, where you could find these implements, and yet they're no more expensive than if you got them at uh, Home Depot or, or your local garden center. They're just not easy to find, but I have the sources. So what I'm going to do tonight is talk a little bit about, uh, many people are now are concerned with the food chain and where things come from. Uh, they're worried about uh, supply chain. And so a lot of people have approached me that they'd like to start their own garden and, and they don't know where to begin or how to do it. Uh, maybe some of you already are gardeners and maybe I can give you a little bit more insight as what to do, or you probably if you're a gardener already, you already know pretty much the ins and outs. But uh, I'm, going for, well, I'm going to start with going over by share, sharing my screen and going over the different types, most popular types of gardens out there, backyard gardens. So I'm going to share my screen right now. Okay. All right. And what I'm going to do close this, I don't need it, um, is go with different gardens that we, we see out there. The first one is uh, what's called an, an open plan garden. Um, pretty much it's a raised bed, but it's not, it's kind of like a no frills raised bed. So what you would see is this particular one, I found these images that I thought kind of portray what they, they, the best ones that I could find that show what they typically, typically would look like. This one is just open raised bed, barely a raised bed with simple pathways through it. These people are growing a lot of beans. That's why they're trellising everything up so they can all climb. So that's your basic garden. If, if you, in between the paths is just the earth. Um, at some point, you're gonna have a weed problem there or grass or something growing there. So this is where the second open plan comes in. Uh, this is a more defined one. This one actually has a little border on it and people between the rows, what they're doing is putting either glass, grass clippings, hay or straw, uh, some leaves or whatever, just as a weed block, which I recommend doing. Um, may not be so easy to walk on, but I would use wood shavings or, 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 or wood chips myself if I was, or some pebble uh, gravel, if I was going to do it in between. They have some sort of fencing here. It's low fencing. So yes, it probably will keep out maybe rabbits and chipmunks, but I think squirrels and uh, woodchucks are gonna get over this one pretty easy. Um, but it's, it's a nice design, it's a little more defined than the other one. The most popular gardening out there is, are raised beds. Um, and I, that's the type of garden I prefer. And when I did have my garden before I had the farm, I had a raised bed garden. I like it for a few reasons. Once it's a, it, one, it, it, it's, it defines the space. It can be laid out very easily. Um, it also, second thing that it really does, it prevents erosion because everything is has a border and it's held within, all the soil is held within the border. So it's not gonna wash away with rain or any kind of problems like that or storms or wind or it's gonna be pretty much there. Um, and what I like, what it did with mine was I like to keep about two feet of space in between each bed because I can get a wagon in there, I can get a mower in there, whatever I need to bring down the row, I can take with me, um, a wheelbarrow, whatever. And uh, I don't like to go high up when I do a raised bed. I like to go, um, I like to maybe 10 inches a foot because once you get too high, uh, it's, 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 it's easy to harvest everything, but sometimes you have to climb in the box to work the soil. And I'll show that in the next slide. Um, and, and again, I think it's a nice way and a defined way to have a garden. Um, Tony, so, question for you. May I ask a question? Sure. So how, how thick do you put the mulch in between? Do you have the mulch in between? And oh, maybe what you do, what, what, what you do with the mulch with the, in between is I would put some sort of a weed, like a garden cloth underneath okay. and then put about two inches of, of mulch. That's all you need. Okay, you know. and how often do you replace that every oh, year? Oh, maybe once, uh, maybe, uh, you'll see as it starts to, it'll start to get gray, it'll start to degrade. So then you just add and mix it in a little bit more every year. You don't have to okay. do much. It's going to last a while. Uh, and then you just keep adding as you go. You'll know when, you'll see it starting to 
to, to decay and it's starting to decompose. So you, what you get is a few bags of others that mix it in. And then it, just as long as you maintain that inch and a half to two inches, you'll be fine. And if you have the, the garden cloth underneath it, that'll be a great weed block. So, and yet it's permeable to water. So the water will drain through it, but the weeds won't come up. So you'll always have a nice clean, like this This one here I'm showing. Now this has a very nice uh, defined uh, pathways with uh, wood chips or, or, or bark. Uh, you can use either one. And this one, it's a little bit higher. They use actually railroad ties with four by fours. And this is about as high as I would go. I wouldn't go any higher because like I say, it's easy to harvest everything, but then it becomes difficult to work the soil. You have to climb up into it. Um, it, it gets unwieldy. So I would try to keep it about 10 inches to a foot off the ground. This one is really nice. I mean, they have a nice fence around it. Um, it's really open. Um, and it's it's probably, the other thing too is the higher up you, you go, the more soil you have to put in it mm. and the maintenance, uh, of keeping the boards from rotting because you can't use treated lumber because treated lumber is loaded with chemicals. So you have to use regular fir or spruce or pine. And I'll show you how to treat it naturally so it lasts a long time. Um, so those are raised beds. Um, an, an offshoot of raised beds are square foot gardening. In fact, on PBS, they used to have a show about square foot gardening. Really what it is, is you take a raised bed or a garden area and you divide it, divide it into square footage. So you kind of can see how to lay, helps you lay out your garden with planting. Um, this one is kind of, I don't know why they needed a square foot on it because everything they planted is running into everything. So it doesn't really need it. Uh, except uh, it helps them say, okay, in this square, I'm gonna put spinach. In this square, I'm gonna put scallions or I'm gonna put uh, chives. But the, the next slide I have shows it better. Um, this is where you would want to use square foot gardening. You put one, these are pepper plants. So pepper plants, you don't want to put them right next to each other. So at least you know that they're a foot apart. One in the center of each square foot is a good distance because they're going to grow. It's going to leave air for them. It's going to leave space. Um, you don't want to put your vegetable plants too close together. Uh, because they can get mildew, they can get mold, they can, uh, especially tomatoes. Tomatoes are very prone to mold and mildew and blight if they're too close together and they're not off the ground. And then they, uh, they did put basil in some of the others. So it's a nice way to do it. Um, there's a, another type of gardening for people who don't have a level, level piece of ground. They, there's terrace gardening. You have two kinds of terrace. Actually, I should show the other one first. You have a simple terrace gardening where it's uh, you use whatever you can. These people use wine bottles for their border. Uh, and then you have a space in between. And as it goes down, this one, they did a weave on this one. They made it very, very rustic looking. And then as you go down, it steps down. And then you leave a little path in between each row to get to your crops. And this is for people who don't have a, a level yard. And you could take it to a more extreme if you're really a serious gardener. Um, this one is really nice. Uh, they're using pavers and railroad ties to define it. Um, this one has the best chance of being relatively pest free because um, not only is it the stairs and then the terracing, but they put this uh, chicken wire fencing around it. Uh, this would be particularly good at keeping deer out because deer when they want to get in your garden, they need a running start. So to get a running start to go into, to jump into here would be very difficult for them. Um, even um, groundhogs and animals like that won't venture too far away from their burrow to get up to this top level because they'd be afraid of predators or what could happen to them. Um, even rabbits are not going to do it. So this one is really, a, it's a good, you know, it's a very nice um, rendition of a, of a, of a terraced garden, very clean, very nice. And they got three levels out of it and pretty pretty fair size levels too. Um, the other thing is I was, I was mentioning to Lottie before is that pallet gardening has really taken off now. Uh, using simple pallets, you can find pallets anywhere. They're giving them away when you go to tile stores, look at out in front of the tile store or, or wherever there's a warehouse, they'll say, take them free. You know, they don't know what to do with them. Uh, but you can make a, a pretty nice garden 
out of the pallet. Just put it in a place in your yard and it's modular. So if you don't like it in one place one year, you can move it. Um, if you're not getting enough sun, you say, oh, you know, I think it would be better on this side of the yard. So you bring it over and you just fill it with soil. And the nice thing about it is the, the boards between the rows are weed block. So you have your own weed block there. You only have to deal with the weeds with the crops, but your crops are gonna be pretty much blocking out the weeds. This is a pretty nice one. The second slide I have shows- So Tony, question for you. Um, yeah. Wouldn't the pallets be treated though? No, pallets are not treated, no. Oh, is that right? Okay, that's good yeah. to know. No, they're not treated at all. Um, they'd be too expensive to make if they were treated because they're usually like throwaway. And a lot of times they break, so they wouldn't waste the time doing it. No, uh, we use pallets at the farm, not for for um, for growing through, but we use them like to, to put things like soil on top and to hold things in our greenhouse. And none of them are ever, they're never treated. So right. I wouldn't worry about that. Okay. Uh, this pallet, th this pallet uh, is really nice. I like this because it's uh, all lettuces. You got everything from romaine to curly to red leaf um, and it's uh, to bib lettuce. And the nice thing about it is uh, if you cut the lettuce along the, the top of the board, use that as your guide, you cut your lettuce straight across it and in about another week or two, the lettuce will be back because it keeps growing. So it, it, uh, this one, I just think it's really nice. They put tar paper on the side, I don't know why, but uh, you wouldn't really have to do that. I would, I'll, I'll show you a good treatment to, to that's all natural that'll preserve it and actually bring out the grain of the wood too. So, uh, so those are them. I did bring pictures of my, my garden when I was in Utley, New Jersey. When I lived in Utley, I had a, a garden on my side yard. And I took two pictures of that that I'd like to show everybody. I used raised beds and I used four by eight lumber, four foot by eight, uh, four foot by eight foot dimension to make the bed. The, the boards come in four, uh, eight foot by uh, two by eight uh, by whatever the thickness is you want by 10 inches. Two, so two foot, um, what do you call it? I'm sorry. Um, eight feet long by 10 inches wide by two inches. So they'd be two by eights by tens. That's the perfect size for, so when you buy three boards, you get one box because you cut one board in half and you have your four by eight dimension. And what I did here is I made the boxes and um, I filled them with soil. The, the soil was terrible. There was all clay. So I had to dig it out and start from scratch, which I'll show. And there was a lot of sandstone on the property. So I made my own pathways. Uh, again, I put some sand underneath and I, I just made the stones, got what stones fit and I fit them together. And that's one, one view of it. And then I have a second view where it shows the other end of it, where I was growing. I was actually growing corn in one box. And then I'd use one for climbing beans, peppers. I had one for onions, lettuces. I even had a, um, a, a for, for composting, I made my own compost pile there. So, and it was very defined, as you can see. It just kept everything neat, clean, off the ground. Uh, so that's what you want, and it made it a lot of fun too. So that's what I did there. So what I have now is the second part of the talk is I like to talk about what do we do when we wanna make the garden? And I have all these handouts, I'm gonna go through some of them. First thing is, where do we get our seeds from? So I have brought this with me. So I'm, uh, these are all available, Lottie. I, I, did I send them to you, Lottie, or do I have to send everything to you? Uh, I, I, I think I sent you all the PDFs, right? I'm not sure, but I will make them all available. So I like to go through the seed sources where, where I would suggest you can get, if you have a good uh, garden center near your home, you can get uh, good seeds there. I recommend uh, these places because we use them at the farm and I didn't even know they existed before I had the farm, but they're a good source to get uh, seeds that have great germination rates. Germination rate means that most of them are gonna come up and we have uh, 98, most of them will be 98% germination. So um, uh, we like to use, um, the preferred one that we like to use is Johnny Seeds, they're in Maine and all their seeds are organic, non-GMO. Uh, uh, they have some hybrid seeds, but again, it's all from non-GMO sources. And you can get everything from a packet all the way up to a 50 pound bag if you wanted to. 
Uh, and the packets are no more expensive than if you went to your garden center or Home Depot, you know, four or five dollars for a, a package of a hundred seeds or whatever, wh whatever it is. They have a great selection. They uh, send, I would recommend going online, getting their catalog, the catalog, you can download or you get the hard copy. I like the hard copies because I like to keep looking through them. Um, and Johnny's is a, is a great organization to deal with. Most of all these places on this list, you have a problem, you're gonna get a person. Uh, so you're not gonna get a recording or a, you're gonna talk to somebody who'll know who, who can help you. Um, High mowing, uh, Johnny's is in Maine. There's another one called High Mowing. High Mowing is in uh, New Hampshire and or Vermont, one of those. And uh, they're good, but they don't have the variety that Johnny's has and they're a little bit more expensive. But we buy a lot of our beans from them. They have a good bean selection. So we buy beans from them. Um, one that I really recommend for gardeners is uh, Seed Savers Exchange. Terrific, terrific place. It's an organization where they get, they have seeds. A rejected can... protection in week five. But Vervecto just won't quit. Let's hear from our veterinarian expert. Vervecto is our clear winner. 12 weeks of powerful protection, nearly three times Um, So I don't know what that was, but, uh, but uh, we have, uh, so we go to the Seed Savers Exchange. Um, they sell seeds that are heritage and heirloom. So you can get seeds that can trace lineages back hundreds of years. They can tell you where a seed came from in Europe, uh, where it was first originated down to the, the town and when it first came to the United States and they can, so they keep the lineage going. So, and they do the same thing with seeds that come from South America, Asia, Europe, uh, United States. So if you buy something, collard greens that came from, let's say Kentucky, they could say, well, this was first bred down here. It was first, uh, uh, planted in, in 1850 and, we're keep, and they found the original seeds or they kept the original, original lineage going. Um, and, and they're very good. You can, I think they're $45 a year to join and then you get a percentage off the, the cost of the seeds. The seeds are very inexpensive, but you'll find seeds there that you won't find anywhere else. And they're really good. We buy some of our tomatoes and peppers from them and they're really good. Um, Fedco is a good company. Hudson Valley Seed, they're right here in Hudson Valley uh, in, um, uh, I think, Poughkeepsie or is it Newburgh, one of those towns. Then we have uh, Dixondale, if you want to grow onions and, and leeks, uh, Dixondale Farms is in Texas. They can send you either onion seedlings and leek seedlings, or you can buy the bulbs and plant them. Uh, we plant the bulbs. Um, you can get seedlings too, um, and seedlings, we used to do seedlings. Uh, they're easy. They come in 60 in a bundle, 70 in a bundle, and it has the little green on it already, and you just plant them in the ground that live. Uh, you just transplant them, and they grow really fast. Harris Seeds is good. Um, they're an old seed company. Two companies I like to work with are Notes Produce Supply and uh, Seed Sa and, um, um, Grower Supply. Notes Produce Supply is really good to get anything you need for... Um, your garden, uh, whether it's tools, tomato cages, uh, boxes, uh, tomato twine, um, whatever you might need that can help your pruning tools. Um, and their prices are great. They're right here in, in New Holland, Pennsylvania. Their shipping is cheap. Uh, they're an Amish company and they're really nice people. Um, I've been out there. It's a great place to visit. Um, Grower Supplies in Connecticut. They're a big company. Um, they have everything. Um, and you can go online and get look at what uh, a lot of stuff they have is primarily for greenhouses, but a lot of it is for gardening too. So that's what I would, uh, these are my suggested seed sources. Then we want to talk about um, what to grow. There's two kinds of crops of, that we have. We have sun crops and we have shade crops. Um, now, I don't have everything on here. I'm sure I left something off. I know right off the bat. I, there's a few I could have added on, but this is, these are the most popular. So people say to me all the time, I, my tomatoes, they, they, the plants are nice, but I'm not getting any tomatoes, but the plants are really big. Well, because you're not getting a lot of sun and it's, uh, the, the plant, the, the leaves are searching, making more leaves to capture whatever sunlight they can capture. So all your strength is going to the leaves, not to the fruit. And so these ones, the ones on the left, you really want to try to plant those on wherever you have sun, full sun or as much sun as you can get. 
um, even if it's four hours a day, three hours a day, you want to do that. Otherwise, it's not going to. You're not going to get much return from it. You're not going to get much yield. Um, the partial shade ones, on the other hand, will flourish in shade and sun. But they really like things like Swiss chard, spinach. Don't need full sun. Radishes is a root crop, so it really doesn't need full sun. And radishes, if you, and then probably some of you know that already, you plant radishes every two weeks, you get a crop. It just grows so fast. Um, lettuces, kale, all that collard greens, they're all low shade, uh, low sun uh, crops, and they they grow very well in um, in in the, those conditions. And uh, uh, so that's my suggestions on that. And I've looked this, I've researched this over the years from my own experience and from other farmers and other gardeners. This is the, the most popular ones out there. I'm sure there's a lot more. If you go online, put in full sun, partial shade, and then you'll probably even get more than I'm giving you. Um, so that's that list there. All, what we also wanted to do is people always ask me, what could I plant next to each other? What goes good? helps each other grow. So you have um, companion planting. And again, this list I know right off the bat, I left I left the eggplant off it. Beans and peas and every, things of that type like to grow with eggplant. But so tomatoes, you, you want to have near it, carrots, cucumbers and onions, peppers, bush beans. Why? Because each one exudes a different level of oxygen or absorbs different levels of nitrogen. So they kind of complement each other on what one give what one takes in, so uh, uh, so that's why they grow well next to each other. So here the same thing, and you've all probably heard all these heard the stories of planting pumpkin and mel melons and squash with the corn because it grows between the rows and keeps the weeds down, and they can climb up the especially the cucumbers and the peas will climb up the the stalks, and then you can get uh, cucumbers growing on your corn stalks. So when you're picking your corn, you can pick your cucumbers at the same time. So you have, uh, you can do that as well. So these are common companion things. Then so question, question about, for uh, you, Tony. Tony, I have a yeah. question. So, so carrots, I mean, you, you can't just plant carrots. You can't, I'm sorry? Yeah, uh, carrots, you know, they need special soil. They need to, you know, you can't, I mean, where well, I am. Carrots, you know, you have carrots, uh, you, you need like sandy, loamy soil because it, you can't uh, have something that's going to be compacted too thick because the carrots will just stump, you know. So when you plant carrots, it's always good to put a lot of peat moss and things like and some sand actually to, to keep the soil loose. And then the carrots will grow really well. And, you know? and will, the, will the tomatoes be okay with that? Yes, yes, tomato, as long as it's a, a nice loamy soil, you know, that has good nutrients in it. And if you're planting the carrots next to the, to the, to the, to the um, I mean, a couple of rows of carrots next to the tomatoes, then when you, when you dig the furrow to put the seeds in with the carrots, you could also mix a little bit of peat moss and sand in it before you do it, just to keep it looser than okay. where the uh, tomatoes are. So you can do that too. Um, these are just suggestions, like you don't have to do it. Personally, I would put all my carrots together in one place because I have to amend the soil a certain way. But some people like companion planting, and I've always asked questions about it. That's why I put that together. But for example, if I'm growing carrots in, in, in my field or in my greenhouse, I'll do it in an area where I've amended the soil to be I put some sand in it, to put a lot of peat moss in it, and mix it all together to keep it nice and soft, because otherwise, the, the dirt is too hard and too stiff. The carrots will just be squatty, very small. They will be lumped together. They won't grow out. Um, fortunately, our soil that we have there is very loose, so they, they grow well. They grow really deep. Um, but if you want to do that in the soil, where, if you have a lot of clay, which I'm going to talk about too, how to break up the clay, um, you want to get rid of the clay. The clay is just going to make everything, especially root crops, compact, and it's bad for root systems. Um, what I did was I put together a, a pH chart because one thing you want to know is um, what's ideal soil for, for growing vegetables. Well, as close to neutral pH as you can get. What is pH? Well, whether the soil is too has too much acid or too much alkaline. One, each one can be bad for the plants. So you want to try to hit that green zone in between here. And that's where, fortunately, most of our 
our plants lie in that zone. And we're lucky that a lot of our soils in this area, um, growing soils, are also within that um, range too. And you can get a, a test kit, which I use, and I, I recommend this test kit. It's only $20. You can get it on, rapid on Amazon. Test. Uh, the rapid test, soil test. Tests for, for uh, pH, make sure your pH level is good. Potash, nitrogen, and, um, and uh, uh, what else is it test? Phosphorus. So those are the things you want to make sure are in balance. Now, this test kit here is you just put a little soil in, put a little water, and then uh, you may, they give you tablets, which are in here, color-coded. You drop a tablet in, mix it all together. And wherever it shows you on the scale, it tells you where your soil is. And so to amend that, you have to put a little, maybe you may have to put a little bit of fertilizer in um, or a little, you may have to add, if, you, if your phosphorus is low, you, uh, you'll have to add a little bit of that. And you can get all this in the garden center. It's not expensive. But usually putting a good, um, a good, uh, fertilizer and will solve the problem. But you shouldn't have too much problem unless the soil has been really mistreated and, and uh, you're in a high acid soil area. It could be a lot of sand in it. You, you don't know until you really test it. But mostly northern New Jersey, Hudson Valley, the soils are really good. So that's one thing I would like to, to do to talk about is that. That's why, and, and you can see all these fall in the same range, anywhere from six or five all the way to eight. And that keeps you in the range of good pH, you know? So that's very important. And then um, people ask me about fertilizer all the time. So um, fertilizer, uh, you, uh, you can get a fertilizer guide. Every state in the United States has a um, ag extension uh, department uh, from the United States Department of Agriculture and the FSA. And what is that? Well, every state, uh, every every state, every county has an agent, an agricultural agent. Um, in New Jersey, the headquarters is in, out of Rutgers University. In New York, it's out of Cornell. So, if you go to the website, uh, you look up your uh, uh, ex uh, USA Extension Service in Cornell on their website, and it'll take you to their own website, and it'll show you. Any problems you have growing anything, they'll have either a PDF or a booklet or something about it. You can call the office. Every county has an office and every county has an agent. So if you're having a particular problem, whether it's gardening or farming, you can ask these agents and they'll help you. That's their job. They'll even sometimes, if it's a bad, bad enough problem, they'll even come out. We've had them out at the farm because ours is in Middletown, New York, the agent and um, out of Cornell University. And a lot of times they put out a lot of guides, a lot of things on, on, on what can on help you. And for this, this one here, I downloaded because I really liked it. And this was from Washington State University, the uh, county agent of Spokane County in Washington State. This one takes the, the most common crops that people grow and shows you what is a great uh, fertilizer to use for that, per, how to apply it and how to, um, when to do it, how many weeks after, how much to use by how much you're growing. So, and they really take you by the hand and it's very good. They even show you how to, how to apply it. Um, and again, I like this because it's, 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 it's a good tool to have. You can also get, I got another one from another source on fertilizers. This is very good. Read this, it'll give you uh, a background on how to use um, fertilizers and what to use. Never use anything like um, miracle Grow or, or synthetic because it'll just deplete your soil and do the opposite effect. Everything will be great as long as you're using it, but if you stop using it, your soil will be neutral. You won't have anything in it. So you want to go with natural. I, I suggest going to your garden center, local garden center, and just picking up a, a bag of generic generic fertilizers. They usually have brown bags of them. You ask the, the man or the woman there and say, listen, I need some 10-10-10 uh, or 10-5-10. They'll tell you, oh yes, here's a bag. You know, a small bag, five pounds, will probably last you for years. You don't put that much on. Um, and it's um, and again, it has the three most important things, the nitrogen, the potash, and the phosphates. And those are going to keep your soil good. If your soil has high acidity, you may have to apply some, some limestone, a little bit of lime, basic dried lime uh, to it to, to bring it back up to more of a neutral. If you're too alkaline, you may have to apply a little bit of sulfur 
to the soil to bring it back into balance. Again, you don't have to do these by extremes, but once you do them, it's really good. Um, so these are, the, again, I'll make these all available to everybody. Um, one thing I forgot to mention too, uh, when we were talking about crops before, is perennials. People always ask me, well, there's perennial flowers, are there perennial vegetables? Well, yes, there are. So you can get, uh, these are the you know, perennial ones that'll come up every year. Special, different, now, not every broccoli will, these varieties will. Same thing with spinach. Spinach will if it overwinters. And I'll show you how things overwinter. Um, uh, herbs, most of your herbs are perennials. Uh, they just keep coming up. We've been growing the same oregano at our farm for 10 years. It just comes back every, every winter. After every winter, every spring, it's back. Fruit, of course, most of your fruit is going to be perennial because it's, it's trees. So trees and, 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 and bushes tend to be perennials. As long as a lot of times, if you have strawberry or raspberry bushes and um, um, currants, or you can have blackberries, if you cut them back in the fall, this way the fresh growth comes up in the spring. So these are, and again, I probably missed some, but these are the most common ones that we have. And people always ask me about extending the season. Uh, and I'll talk about that as soon as I go over the next few things. Um, books, things that can help you. I have a, 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 a sheet here on um, books that I have that are, are really good and that I recommend. And they're, some of them are geared towards small farming, but they really can be used in, in garden situations. Heirloom is about growing heirloom tomatoes. Great book. The, book, the man who wrote it, Tim Stark, was a he was a writer. He lived in this book about two years ago on, on heirlooms, tomatoes. He was a writer. He lived in Brooklyn. He came from Pennsylvania. And he, in his, he, got, he, was, uh, he got obsessed with growing tomatoes in his apartment and out on the fire escape. And then he ran out of room, had all these grow lights, so that he bought a farm. I think he got it from his family out in Pennsylvania. And now he's one of the biggest growers of, of, of organic heirloom tomatoes on the East Coast. He's always at the, uh, at the um, Union Square Market in the city. I've spoken to him. He's a nice fella and he's got his whole family's involved. And he really only grows our heirloom tomatoes and heirloom hot peppers. That's it, nothing else. Back to Basics is a good book on, on growing and homesteading. Self-sufficiency handbook, very good. How to Grow More Vegetables, that's uh, self-explanatory, great book. Uh, anything by Elliot Coleman is good. Uh, he was the first per person who really started the organic movement in this country back in the mid 60s. And he still operates his farm in Maine called the Four Season Farm. And he grows everything year round by through either with greenhouses or in the field. And he publishes a lot of books on it. One book that I really like, and I have my copy right here, is The Have More Plan. The Have More Plan is, let me see if I can, everybody can see it. It's a great book on, um, on um, having your own little homestead. Uh, there, there was a couple, this book was printed in 1941, not this particular issue, but edition, but um, it was started by a husband and wife team, uh, Ed and Carolyn Robinson. He was a writer. He lived in Manhattan in 1941. They were tired of the rat race and tired of living in the big city. So they bought a little homestead, three acres in Connecticut, and they wrote this book on how to grow and they became as self-sufficient as they could. He still kept his job, but he, get, he devoted a lot of time to growing, to raising chickens, to, to uh, preserving, putting up the vegetables and, you know, um, in jars and they became real experts at everything. And the book has been in continuous publication since 1941. It was given to returning GIs uh, by the Department of Defense when they were coming back from World War II, each GI got a copy of this book in case they wanted to go into farming when, right off the, when they came back from the war. So uh, you can get it on Amazon. It's like $10 or $12. It's a great book. It's the original print, reprint of the original. It has the original illustrations, the original photographs, a terrific book. Another thing I like to talk about too is this garden planner. My wife found this online and I bought one. It's called Clyde's Garden Planner. And I'll give the link on this too, so you can order it. This is a great tool. It's a slide rule for gardeners. Um, what you do with this thing is, um, has a red line there. The red line is 
you line that up with the on the top with the on the top with the last frost date in your area. So let's say that I don't know when the, the last frost date in Booton might be the end of April. I'm going to say April 19th. Uh, so you line up April 19th with the red line, and then you look at the FP. Let's say you want to put tomatoes in. You move across, and it'll tell you your first planting of tomatoes should go in May 24th. So that's when you want to put uh, your your first you know, your first uh, plants in the ground. And that's a good idea because people say right after Mother's Day, but sometimes you can have a frost or a cold spell after Mother's Day. Usually like to wait a week after Mother's Day to put them in the ground. So this book, this uh, slide also has companion planting um, when your harvests are expected by the check marks will tell you when you can start picking things, uh, planting by the moon, phases of the moon, how far apart to put the plants. He tells you everything. And he tells you for the most, most of your basic crops, anything from corn, peppers, eggplant, everything, beans, cucumbers, melons. Then he also, on the other side, when you flip it over, he talks about fall planting. And it works the same way. $6, it's unbelievable. You can't go wrong. It's such a great tool. And uh, I wish I had this when I was doing gardening years ago, because it just, it's like in this little slide rule, it, it's just packed with information and it's, it's terrific. So that's what I recommend there. Um, when we're talking about extending the season, people like to start early and uh, like to uh, plant things that'll last till frost. So in, in the pictures here, I have a thing about, uh, Call about row covers. Row covers are covers that you could use plastic, you can use, some people use glass. We found this to be really great. It's called Agribond. And Agribond is a material. Uh, I don't know if it's polyester or natural. I think it's a natural weave. And what it is, is it protects the crops in the ground. Tony, uh, how do you, how do you spell that? Oh, A G R I. B O N D, Agribond. I'll send that to you too, Lottie. I'll send that to you. Great. Thank you. Um, and what you buy by the roll, you can buy a small roll anywhere to hundreds of feet long. Um, and what you do is you put it, if there's going to be a frost, you say, a few years ago, I had a friend of mine who put his tomatoes out and, they, and he was worried. He was in Whippany, New Jersey. He said, What am I going to do? I put the tomatoes out and it's going to be cold in the next few days at night. I said, listen, I'm at the farm. I'll bring you some Agribond. Just throw it over. Keeps everything six degrees, five or six degrees warmer underneath. So that was enough. So if it was going to be like in the low 30s, it was enough to keep that in the high 30s just to keep it above freezing. It might even give you more protection. So, um, and I have samples that normally if I was doing this live, the company that makes it, they sent me the, all the samples. They have different thicknesses. Of course, the, the thicknesses, um, the more thick, the thicker it is, the more cold protection you're going to get. But the other end of the coin is it's it's thicker, so you get less light. We like to use it to form like a 20% block. And I wouldn't go any more than 30% uh, because they already have reduced sunlight in the spring and in the, in the winter anyway. You don't want to reduce it more, but it really works. And you don't have to lift them during the, you can leave it on during the day and whatever heat is absorbed in there, will it'll retain the heat underneath it. And you can store it. You can, we, we store ours. This is our greenhouse and we grow, we cover them with the beds. We bought this cheap um, conduit, um, electrical conduit and bent it. And then we, we put them over and because we grow in the winter. It's an unheated greenhouse. So we only grow winter things like, like cilantro and spinach, lettuces, things that I like to grow in the cold. And then what we did, we only uncover it when we're watering it. And then we cover it back up and it's covered during the day and at night. And it really, really works because when you, sometimes I'd come back and I, after a few days and I'd lift it up and I'd see all this beautiful spinach because the spinach was just at the right temperature. And, and it's then, and you, you can store it, uh, you can use it. We've, we've used the same Agrabon for like six or seven years already. And, and, and as long as you take, it's like anything else, as long as you take care of it, it's gonna last. You roll it up, put it in a plastic bag and it's fine. Um, and then at this point, I like to talk about what tools we use in the garden uh, at the farm that you can use in your garden that I was saying they're not readily available. So I'm going to stop the share now and I'm going to reposition my 
camera because I have to show the tools now. So I'm going to step back from the computer. I think this is good here. All right. So four different types of tools that we use. First thing I'll start with is different types of hose because a lot of times you can get a hose, you can get hose in a Home Depot or, or your garden center. And a lot of times the hole is too big. If they have this big square thing with it, it's kind of a, it's almost too big when you're dealing with seedlings. We like to use something like this. And the reason I like to use this is it's modular. If something goes wrong with the blade, I can just two screws, I can just buy a new blade. I don't have to buy the handle. I don't have to buy the armature. I just can, re or I could take the blade off and sharpen it on a wheel and put it back on. This is the original blade. This thing, we've had this since 2013. So, uh, and we've sharpened it many times. And the and nice thing about this hoe is you can work it on the flat and you can work it on the side where you have the point if you wanna make furrows. So we like to use this a lot. And it's about four inches wide, which is about what you want. And sometimes they sell these big things that if you're, you know, like, uh, you know, they're almost too big for gardeners. Maybe if you're out in the field planting commercially potatoes, yeah, it's great. But we wanna have a garden, this is a garden tool. And we use um, a smaller version. You know, the funny oh. thing is, Tony, that that's exactly the one we use for the sugar beet. Well, I'm sorry, Lonnie. When I was growing up and we were, we were hoeing the sugar beets, that's exactly the kind we use. Yeah, and you guess where that's made? Sweden. Ha <laughs> ha. Uh <-huh. laughs> so, and there's another version. This is a smaller one. So when you're planting seedlings and you have tiny seedlings, you don't want this big rake next, this big hoe next to it, you're gonna knock everything down. You have to, you know, they, you don't wanna shock the, the, the baby plant. So you use a small one. Again, it's got an offset handle. Um, you just sharpen the blade. And this thing is good for tiny, tiny seedling. You wanna get the weeds away from them. So we use this one too. And I always recommend when you get the handles, um, give them a coat of mineral oil every once in a while because the handles will dry out if you don't do that. And you, and you want to keep the tools working for you as long as you can. You don't want to keep spending money on tools. So uh, that's what we use there. And then to get rid of weeds, we use a steropo. Uh, steropo is kind of like a stirrup of a horse. You know, if you're getting on your saddle and your horse, this gets underneath, this you work into the ground, it gets the root ball, it gets under the roots, and then it breaks up the root. Again, uh, you can take the blade off, four screws, the blade comes off, you can replace the blade, or you can just take it off to sharpen it. Um, so again, if something goes wrong with the blade, you just get the blade. You don't have to buy the armature, you don't have to buy the handle. So it becomes very economical to use. Again, this one, we've used this for years. And they come in different sizes. So if you have a small, they come smaller, they come bigger. And they really you work them into the soil and they get underneath and then you get the whole root ball. Because many times when you're pulling weeds, a piece of that root's going to stay there. This will prevent that from happening. It'll, it'll really help you get below and get them out of there. And that's what you really want to do. So, so Tony, uh, what kind of sharpening tool do you use? Uh, we use, uh, like I have a, uh, just regular files. You know, you can get, uh, uh, we actually use sometimes wood files because this is, you know, just steel. It's not going to, uh, wood files are tempered, but you can buy files just to file metal files. And, you know, you get them in Home Depot. They're not really expensive. So you have one or two, maybe a round one and one that's semi half round and flat. That's uh -huh. all you need. And we just go just, oh, you can even use, believe it or not, we've even used, you know, your knife sharpener. You can use that too. <laughs> that works great because it's the same thing. Okay. Um, then we need to have little, we have things for planting. Uh, a lot of times when you, when you plant uh, beans or peas or anything like corn and, and any seeds, you really have to get, you have to dig the furrow and you have to get down in the dirt and you have to, you know, throw the little seeds in. Well, we have a couple of tools that really make that easy. This one's called a stand and plant. All it is, is PVC pipe. What does it do? Well, what it has is a it called? Could, could you spell that, please? Yes, yeah, stand, S-T-A-N-D, and, and plant, P-L-A-N-T, stand and plant. I can show the little logo. and Everybody see it? Stand and stand plant, and plant cedar. cedar. Now, uh, there's a story behind this. There's a farmer out in Pennsylvania near Pittsburgh, a dairy farmer, 
His name is Frank Oliver, and he builds these in the winter. He, he, he with his grandson. He started. He has a big, a little, not big, a pretty fair sized machine shop, and he came up with this idea because during the summer when he's doing his dairy, he's also planting a lot of onions. He does a lot of onions, so he came up with this idea of to plant onion seedlings, and it worked with everything. So what does it do? You squeeze this little handle here. I don't know if you see that, yep. but when you squeeze that handle, what happens? This little door opens up, right? You see that? No, so what happens? Why does it do? Quack, so what quack. you do? What you do is you plunge it into the ground, you drop the seed, open the door, lift it up, and go to the next one. So you just walk down the row, dropping seeds, and uh, it backfills it. So we use this at the farm to plant corn, beans, and we plant it right through our plastic mulch. And we just jab it. It's a jab planter. That's really what it's called. And it, what does it do? You didn't have to. You don't have to bend down. You just like, and you can do multiple rows by just fanning out. I read you could do maybe four rows at a time. And uh, once you get the rhythm, it's really it's really easy to use. And uh, I'll make the link available too, so you can deal directly with him. He's a nice man, a nice um, company. And they, I, you know, he doesn't charge anything for shipping. Uh, he's really really good. And we have two. We we use these a lot. We also have one that and he so made. Tony, Tony, those are for bigger seeds, yes? Uh, actually, you can listen. We, we throw, when I do, when I plant a bunch of radishes, I just throw a bunch of radishes down. And that's it. And the radish seeds are small. And then, because when we plant radishes, I don't plant one at a time because we want to, we pick them, we want to pick a bunch, you know? Okay. So if you throw about 10 seeds, you can throw about, you can take, uh, we did the same thing with basil. We just throw a bunch of basil in a pinch. Just take a pinch. It works uh, with anything. Okay, so you throw in a little at a time. You don't fill yes. it up. And then we get all our basil comes up and all our uh, oh, radishes. Okay. We've radishes that part. Still. So you can do pretty much anything with it. And then I do have, uh, I'll show you another one, a larger version. He came out with this one. And I'll show a little video on this later. Uh, this is a larger version of, this is the bigger standard plant. Same standard plant. Uh -huh. Now this is, you asked me about this before, what does this do? This plants seedlings, tomatoes. You know when you go to the garden center and you buy your tomato sets and your pepper sets and your eggplant? Well, what you do is you take this one, you plunge it in the ground, same thing, you squeeze the handle, it opens up, see that? So see how worn out it is from us using it? We just plunge it in the ground, you drop the seedling in, open the door, drop it up, go to the next one, drop it, and if the dirt is nice and soft, it just backfills. You don't have to do anything, you know? Sometimes you may have to tuck them in a little bit if you're not going deep enough, but this thing will go about five inches, six inches deep. So we use this and we use these a lot. And I'll show a video of when we plant the tomatoes at our farm, how it works. You can do a row of tomatoes. We usually we have two people. One will be the feeder and one will be the plunger. And then they just walk down the row together. And uh, can do a row a couple hundred feet long in, in, in 15, 20 minutes, you know, of planting tomatoes. So we use this a lot. Um, there's another tool that I picked up recently that uh, they sent me to test this out. This one is called, no, no, I don't think you've ever seen this one, Lottie. This one's called yeah. the zipper. <laughs> What is this? Okay, you'll get, you'll understand a lot in a second what this is. This is a hoe. On this side, you dig the furrow in the ground, right? Oh, and then you cover it up on the other side. Then you turn it over, it backfills, grabs the dirt from both sides, and fills it into the hole. Wow. Now, we plant, we use this, we use this in uh, to plant garlic in the fall. So we went down the row just like this, and then dropped the, the cloves in turned it over and then it pulled the soil right over. That's why they call it the zipper because it acts like a zipper. So it pulls the soil from both sides. After you make the furrow, you turn it over, it's pulling the soil from both sides of the furrow right on top and making a mound. And it works really well. And, uh, and you can get this at a couple of places. Johnny sells it. There's a farm in New York where they developed it called the Never Sink Farm. They sell it too. They sent me one. I'm, test putting, I'm putting the the um the link up right now. Okay, Never Sink Farm and Johnny's. They both sell this. So um, then, for people who are really ambitious and want to uh, put these tools, in. I also have a. Uh, 
You might have seen this too, Lottie, because this is a, a rake from Sweden also. This is a big rake. See this? Yeah. This is when, you, when you're working in your garden. They sell you these little rakes in, in, in Home Depot. You want to, this covers a lot of ground at one time and, and, and it doesn't disperse as much. So you want to get a rake that's at least two feet wide. And the nice thing about it is um, you can use the rake as row markers. If you're, I have a set here, I think they're somewhere. Um, yeah, you, you put these little things on. Let's say after you, you rake your soil, you get it nice and even. And they even sell these uh, row, these markers with it. So you can, let's say you want to put in five rows of beans, but you want to make sure they're all even. You put these little tubes on, space them out. And then what it does, it marks the, it marks the rows for you. So you, you put them every, however, however far apart you want them, and then you put them and then you drag it and it'll mark the row so you know where to plant. So it does double duty. It's a great rake. And this rake is good. It's an adjustable blade that goes in and out. You can just adjust it by loosening the bolts and loosening the screw and moving it. So you can grab more waste or less, or you can turn more dirt over or less dirt over. And this works really good too. We've been using this for a long time. And it's got an extra long handle too. It's got a six foot, six, seven or six and a half foot handle. So when you're doing a whole bed, you can do the whole bed in two passes. So you don't have to do you know, any extra work. You don't want to have all this extra work to do. Do you have a brand name for that one? Uh, this one's called, um, the company that makes it is uh, P-R-E-V-A, Preva. Okay, Preva. I think it's a Swedish company. Okay. Those they make it. They just know what uh, then, then we have this tool. If any of you garden and you have a, um, a long, like a linear garden, you're, you're gardening in a long space. Let's say you want to put a lot of, uh, a row of uh, lettuce in, you want to put a row of uh, kale, you want to put a row of collard greens or Swiss chard. That's a lot of little seeds and it's a lot of work to do that. Um, so we bought this thing, and we use this at the farm. They used to use this when I had the garden too. This is called an earthway seeder. It's a seeding machine. It costs about $100, that's it. What does it do? Look at it, it looks like something out of the 19th century. That's because it is. Uh, well, except now it's made out of plastic and aluminum. Before it was wood and steel or iron. What it is, is um, it's a planting machine. Inside here, you, would pl you pu put all your seeds in here. You pu pour them all in. It has this wheel in it, and the wheel has little indentations and grooves. So as you turn, as you go, it's on a belt. As you go, the wheel spins around. What is the wheel doing? As it spins around, the wheel is grabbing a seed and dropping it into, on this side, and dropping the seed into the hopper, which is going down. And it goes in between, the plow here is hollow, goes in between the, pl the, pl the hollow of the plow, the plow digs the hole, the seed gets dropped into the hole, the, the furrow, and then as you're going, the chain backfills the furrow and the back wheel presses it down. So, and what you can do is for different crops, you have different wheels and it comes with six wheels. So if you wanna plant 50 feet of beans, you just load your hopper up with beans, put the correct, I'll show the wheel first, put the correct, uh, I'll show you the differences. For example, this is a wheel for beans. You can see how big they are, right? That's a wheel for beans. And as it turns, it grabs one of the peas and puts it in. And this is something, this one is for very small. This one's for lettuces. You can see, because it's grabbing very small area. Yeah. This one is for corn. This one, and it spaces them out properly. It's, it's got the space all figured out. We have one that's really big. This is for lima beans because look at the size of the lima bean is gigantic, right? So you have that. So all you do is like, you fill your hopper up, you get the correct wheel in, you, you, you kick the little stand up, and then you just walk behind it. And as all this is happening, you actually hear on the bigger seeds, you hear them going down, dink, 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 as you walk. And then what you can do is it has a row marker. You can put the marker down and then you'll make a furrow. So you can follow, keep them in even spacing. You can mark your second row, mark your next row. So if this is only good, if you're doing something linear, 20, at least 25 feet, this will save you a lot of time and it pays for itself because in no time, because like I say, it's still around a hundred dollars. They last forever. We've had this since we've had the farm and we use it every year 
to plant corn, to plant um, to plant uh, 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 beans primarily with it, things of that peas, and it works really well. And uh, I can't say enough about it. You could uh, you could plant an acre of corn with this thing in about an hour by just walking up and down. And it's a great aerobic exercise. You don't have to go to the gym. You just use this. Yeah. Well, that's what we have in that. Um, for anybody, I, I just wanted to show this book. There are a couple of really good books that are old books. They're so old. There's two books that, uh, this was printed in 1943. This one's called The Plowman's Folly. And this was a book about no till written in 1943, okay? by Edward Faulkner. He was a great agriculturalist uh, in the United States. And he talks all about low, low plow or no plow, which is very popular now. You don't want to disturb the soil that much. So this is, a, and you can still get this book on Amazon. This is an original from 1943. I think it cost me 20 bucks. Um, there's another book that my wife found this book, Success with Small Fruit by E.P. Rowe. E.P. Rowe was, uh, he lived in Cornwall, New York. I read this book. He told you, he was all about planting berries and, and, and uh, raspberries, strawberries, blackberries. He knew everything about it. And he lived in Cornwall, New York. So he knew all about Bergen County. He knew all about Rockland County, all about the soils and all these illustrations. The original book was printed in 1882, I think. This one was reprinted in 1900. And we still use this when we plant our strawberries and we transplant, we use his method. And, it, and this book, you can get it in soft cover on Amazon. They still have it in paperback, but that I think it's like 20 bucks. So I looked it up and I said, I can't believe it. It's still in publication. So uh, these are so these are things you can find and makes gardening fun and interesting. So there's lots of books. People also ask me about how do I get rid of bugs and stuff like that. We use this at the farm, Monterey Garden Insect Killer, okay? It's organic, it's OMRI um, um, listed, which means it's got you know, really no, no, no harmful um, carcinogens in it. We only use something that's natural, but we only use it so, for- two So Tony, is it a, is it a pyrethrin? No, it's a, it's a spinosad, you know? Uh, which is a different type. Um, it uses a sp spinoza. Uh, I don't know much about it, but uh, they told me this is what I should be using. It's for organic gardening. You have the pyrethiums and you have the spinozids. Okay. Um, so this thing is, we only use it in two places because we don't have really pest problem. The only problem we have is potato beetles and, and cucumber beetles. They will just eat all the, they, they go for the eggplant and they just will, you, You'll get the eggplant down to where it just sticks in like a day if you leave this going. They'll eat the potatoes too, potato greens. So if you give a couple of applications of this, your problems are solved. But it also has a complete spectrum of insects that it kills and deters. So it'll get you rid of your mite problem for any kind of hookworm problems, any type of uh, borers that bore into you. A lot of people say to me, my Zucchini, I get these root borers. Well, when you put your zucchini seed in the ground or you put your zucchini seedling in the ground, in the hole before you put the seed or the seedling, spray a little bit of this in there. Then put it in, then spray it around after you backfill. You'll never have a problem again. So, mm -hmm. so actually it sounds like it doesn't really affect the pollinators because you're not spraying no, it. The, no, it, it's all, it doesn't hurt the good insects. It only gets the bad ones. And I don't know how they do that, <laughs> but they do it. <laughs> you know? So that's what, and we've been using it for years and we have so many pollinators up there. It's, it's unbelievable. The bees and everything, the butterflies, the amount of butterflies, bees. We have so many um, hummingbirds up there too. The hummingbirds are amazing. You know? Hummingbirds practically come right to you. We bought this new tool this year that we're gonna use. I just got it. Um, we know when you, in your garden sometimes or in your farm, you have a, you can make a hole for a, what they call a devil. You can use this to make the hole to put the, the plant in. So yeah. you, make, you make a hole and then you drop your little plugs. Because a lot of times we plant from plugs that we start ourselves. So it's tedious to do one at a time. So uh, we had one kind of a, a machine we were using. I wasn't happy. I found this one. And we're going to use this for the first time this year. Is that We bought this dibbler. 
Let's see how many holes are there. <laughs> now, the nice thing about it. I'm sorry, is, Tony, that looks like a torture weapon. It does, it does. It can be used as a torture weapon, but that's another program. So anyway, <laughs> um, this is a... Uh, this is three inches apart. You can set it for four inches, six inches, eight inches, 10 inches by removing the, the and then it was the same thing. You just put it down and you just walk behind it, push it and it makes all the holes. Now you can use this in your garden if, you, if you're doing things with, if you go to your garden center and you buy little plugs. Um, a lot of times we plant, uh, when we plant our Swiss chard and we plant our kale, we start them in plugs 512 in a flat. And then when they come up, we just pull them out and put them in the ground. But we're going to use the dibble to do it this year. We had another one, but I was not happy with it. But this one we're going to be using, and uh, it's, I think we're going to have a good success rate with it. So, and again, these are not that expensive. These tools, so you can do that if you want to start so your own. This one is, is from Tillmore. Too bad, cat. Uh, I'm sorry. This one is from Tillmore. Oh uh, no, the company that makes this is called. The two, the two bad cats LLC. They're in, I think they're in um, Vermont. It's a couple of guys. They build these in Vermont. You know, it's called Two Bad Cats LLC. WW here. Can you see? It? Yeah. yeah, yeah. They make a whole bunch of different tools. I mean, their stuff is good. You know, so they. Again, these are things you're not going to find any everywhere, but they are things. That can make gardening a lot of fun and, and give you a lot of you know good yield on your crops and and, and uh, so these tools and of course we use a lot of hand tools shovels and 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 whatever and, and uh, weed things and, and such so but those are common you can get those anywhere we also use this people ask me about watering what about watering well you can uh, we put a timer on ours and it's simple hose goes in here you know. Uh, the, the, the oscillator or the fan thing, whatever you want to set up goes there. You can set it to water every day, every other day. Um, you know, you can program it. Two batteries, two AA batteries. The batteries last the whole season. It's waterproof. And we use these in the greenhouse and they're terrific. So you don't have to worry about extensive water systems and all that. No, simple timer. You hang this on by your hose and then you walk away from it and the water's at five o'clock every day or five o'clock every other day, whatever, for an hour, 30 minutes, whatever you set it on. So those are the things that we do. So that's what, where we're at. So I'm gonna sit down now. And if anybody has any questions. Oh, I wanted to show one film first before. Uh, I wanted to show one little film on how we use the, um, um, how we use the, uh, the red, transplanter. Um, if you allow me, let me go to movies. Okay, I'm going to go back to share screen and we'll show how we use the, uh, I got to find the right one. No. Um, yeah, this is how we work, how we work it. And that's my son. My son is the plunger here. Oh, you are not, you're not sharing just yet. Oh, oh yeah, I didn't share yet. I... Okay. Is it shared now? Yes. Not... Is it sharing? Oh, there we are. You got it, Lottie? Is it there? Yep. Okay. Watch. Here we go. All right. I mean, that totally looks. What like happened a here was they gave me. <laughs> it totally, totally looks like a boy's tool. And that plastic is natural. That's all made out of cornstarch. See how it goes in. And then we had on one another member of the crew. Just make sure that sometimes they don't stand up uh, because these they gave me these back too big. It should have been a little shorter. She's going in and making sure that everything is tucked in and watered and standing up. And now the other fellow, he's going back to get another flat of uh, to start to continue where they let, left off. And then we put all, those are all tomato plants going in. See, they're going to start the next batch. And that's 32 tomato plants in a flat. Wow. And then they go to the next one. And uh, that's how we do it with that. And then I have a film on how we put the plastic with the machine uh, we, this is me on the tractor putting the running out the plastic with the mulch layer. And then the boys make sure that it's tucked in because it automatically tucks it into the ground on each side. Then the ends we do by hand. But the machine has a series of, of, of plows, little plows and wheels to push the, the, um, the, the, the mulch underneath. Again, this is not made out of plastic. It's made out of 
non-GMO cornstarch and it dissolves by December, it's gone. It just goes back into the soil and we till it in. So here's a little video on that. And he's just, uh, this fellow here, he's just making sure that it's, everything's level on each side. So, and that's how we do it. And I just go, each row is about 300 feet long. And then we plant all our stuff through that. And that's where that dibble machine I show you, we'll run that on there, puts mm -hmm. all the holes. So we put our onions in, our onion sets. And, uh, and so some of it's by hand, some of it's by, by and that the back there is, is all soybeans growing in, in the back. You know? So that's how that works. So that's how we, we do those things. And there's one little video I like to show everybody because this is really, uh, really nice. Uh, this is what happened last spring. I was just getting ready to use the tractor, but I, I, could, I wasn't ready to actually go out in the field yet, but I said, uh, but I, I postponed using it for a little while and I'll show you why. And uh, watch the video and you'll see why I postponed using the tractor. Uh-oh, oh, the Robin. So I had to wait. I had to wait till they, they hatched until I could use everything because I didn't want to disturb them. So I didn't want to move the nest. So I didn't really use the tractor. But that's basically, that's what we do. And that's, uh, that's, the, that's, that's it. So if anybody has any questions, if I can help anybody, I'll try my best. I don't know everything. I've learned every, what I've learned, I've learned over the years. And, and if I don't know the answer, I'll try to help you to find out you know, what the answer is. So anybody wants to unmute? They can I have, ask a, directly I have or... a question. Can, can you um, advise when you would plant from seed versus from uh, uh, like a seedling? Like oh, how do you sure. make the like, decision? Um, certain things I would plant from seedlings. I, I wouldn't plant tomatoes from seed or eggplant or peppers uh, because they take long to germinate. You got to start them like when it's still cold out, you'd have to start them indoors and you'd have to make sure that you have constant um, temperature. Your temperature has to be kept at the, sa the same day and night and uh, when they're germinating. And also when they, once they come up, you have to make sure they have full sunlight. So for example, people will say, oh, I started my tomato plants, but they weren't coming that good. Well, that's because at night you were turning your heat down. So you don't want the same heat all the time. They can't go from cold to hot. So those things I recommend getting seedlings from. Things like kale and uh, spinach and um, cilantro, uh, radishes, lettuces, those I'd put in by seed because uh, they, they're pretty hardy and, and they, and I'd be putting the seed like for lettuces. For example, at the farm, we already planted our spinach and our cilantro because they like to grow in the cold. And next week we'll put out the kale and the um, Swiss chard and the uh, arugula, mm -hmm. things that like to be cool. And we start that from seed. So that's what I would do. And, and you can start them indoors, but you but I would put them right in the garden right now. I would do my spinach immediately. I wouldn't wait. This is perfect weather for spinach germination. Spinach. Um, any type of uh, parsley oh, no. is grow now, <laughs> things like that. Um, kale, Swiss chard, collard greens, things of that type will really start growing. They, they don't like to grow when it's too hot. Basil likes to grow when it's warm. Um, parsley likes to grow when it's cold, cool. Um, they don't, the spinach will stop growing in the summer because it doesn't like the heat. So what we do is we plant two crops of spinach. We'll plant in, in, in March, we'll start the spinach, and then we'll plant it again the end of August. And then we'll have it all the way through the frost. Mm -hmm. And if we protect it, we'll have it through the winter. And, and, and actually to, to, to that, um, Tony, um, my mom always grew the, um, uh, the New, New Zealand spinach, which mm -hmm. seemed to just grow forever. Yeah, New Zealand spinach is really hardy. That's like the perennial. That'll come up every year. And, oh, is that right? Uh, I did not uh, know that. Yeah, that'll come up. It's a, it's a perennial. Uh, what happens is it, you have to protect it. It'll grow through the winter, but you really would have to put like a row cover over it unless you have a mild winter, uh, you know, but then it'll survive. We had kale so over winter without even covering it one year. I think it was 2015. We were amazed. In the spring, it started growing again. 
because the winter wasn't that severe and we were able to get two years out of the kale. So you can do it, but, but if you put the row covers on, you'll really, you, you'll, you can really overwinter with kale and you can overwinter with the, the New Zealand spinach is excellent. And so that. you're just using the electrical, the electrical things? Yeah, we, we bought a pipe bender and we just bend the pipe with it. And it, those conduits are only a couple of dollars each. So I think they're aluminum and they bend so easily and we save them. We use them, we put them out in the field or we use them in the greenhouse. And then we put the, the Agribond over it and we put little stakes to hold it and cl little cl um, clamps. You can buy those uh, little clamps that you squeeze, you know, you buy those little yeah. simple clamps and we put them on the pipes and it stays, you know, so, and you don't have to go, we've been pretty high in the greenhouse, but you can go lower. You don't have to be as high up as we were. We did it because it was easy, mm -hmm. but, but, uh, but you can go down to uh, as much as, as uh, almost to where it's touching the plants to where it's like a foot high. So you, the closer to the plant, even better, you get more protection. We were already in a greenhouse, so we didn't care, you know, so. All right. I have one more question. Um, for the home gardener, what do you recommend for like topsoil or compost brands? I'm glad you asked that, me that question because I have to show you, let me move this. I forgot to show that one. And obviously not miracle Grow. <laughs> oh, no, let me miracle Grow, please. Um, let me see, let me see if I can move this out of the way. Uh, hold this bar, excuse me, let me go to, yeah, I did forget one of the handouts. I'm gonna share the screen again. There's my share button here. Where's my share? Uh, you are, I think you are sharing, Tom. I am sharing still? Yeah, okay. to the best okay, of my let, uh, let me go to the, um, I had the, uh, Oh yes, this is what I what I did. Can everybody see this? Is that everybody seeing this? Not just yet. Am I on share? Yep. Okay. Uh, let me go to uh, let me full size this thing. Okay. This is what I came out with when I lived in Nutley. We had, the the dirt was so bad that it was all clay. So I made my raised beds. I put them in the ground, and then I just uh, what do you call it? I dug out a couple of inches below ground. And I found that if I measured that if I put this amount of soil in, uh, topsoil, eight bags of topsoil, three of compost, a bag of cow manure, and about three cubic feet of peat moss, and mix that all together, I had a real good mix, and the pH was really good. And I filled the boxes, and it was enough to fill one four, uh, four foot by eight foot box by 10 inches high. And that's what I would use. And there's a, I would just go to, you can get, you can get you can get topsoil anywhere. You just want to get a good grade. I would almost go to a garden center to get topsoil. It's not that expensive, and they have a good uh, booster for topsoil that you can put. That's uh, called Bumper Crop. Put it's a new it's a thing that's a, an enhancer for topsoil, and it has everything crushed shells and lobster shells, everything in there, and it's called Bumper Crop. Put a bag of that in with this. And you'll get really good, uh, really good yields. And then I was talking about what how I painted the boards. I used three parts of odorless mineral spirit made out of alcohol, uh, and with one part of boiled linseed oil. Mix that together and then paint it on with a paint roller. Give it about three coats. It'll last as long as the treated lumber without any any toxins. So I would do that. Yeah, and this uh, I'm going to give to everybody. To everybody will get this sheet. Lottie, did I send you everything? Um, uh, uh, some of the things that that you have shown tonight have were not in the in the in the. Um... I'm going to make sure you get everything tomorrow. Okay, I'll send you perfect. everything. And I'll make sure that there's a link, and I'll make sure that there's printout too. Yes, um, I'll send you all the printouts and the links to the different companies, so you can you can everybody can go to them if they want to see anything or get any more information. You know, there's a lot of information out there and a lot of good companies. These companies like uh, Johnny's and Seed Savers Organization, they're terrific. They're doing a great job. And we've tested, like I said, we've used a lot of their seeds and we've never been disappointed. Everything comes up. And the germination rate, that's what you really want to make sure you have a good germination rate. The worst thing is you could plant a bunch of seeds and then half of them only come up. But with these, the, the, these people, you'll get like 95 to 98% of the seeds will come up, which is terrific, you know. 
So basically that's it. So all right. Well, Tony, this was this was a lot of stuff to 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 take away. Um <laughs> But at the same time, I'm like totally. A lot of information, but you know, I only have so much time. I, can't. <laughs> I know, but you know what? I'm I'm yeah. thinking, I'm thinking that what I want to do for the library is to go out and buy all of those tools, and then we can lend them out. Um, yeah, that's a really can, good idea. Uh, because we are all the small gardeners. Yeah, and, a lot of libraries do seeds. They do seed things too. Um, I tried the seasoning, but I think you yeah, know what? You I think the tool, the, the the whole thing. The tools are better. Things. People like the tools, you know. Yeah, well, the, the tools are a hit, you know, uh, and and the tools are, are really important because sometimes people want to make the investment, but if you got let's say one of those dibbler tools and oh, yeah. people could share oh, yeah. it and use it, well, you know, yeah. then it gets After used, the, I mean, you, you know, only use or even the standard plan. So, yeah. so I think I think that's no, gonna all, be that's good. gonna be the Boonton Library's next foray into the Library of Things. That sounds that sounds like a great idea. <laughs> uh, and can we come visit your farm? Absolutely, everybody's welcome. I'll put a, I'll include my email on there, so anybody ever has a question, they can email me directly. Um, uh, you have my, the address of the farm. Yep. Uh, I think you should have it right up in yep, uh, we do. Island, we do. New York. Um, Right. I'll give everybody that too. And you can come up during the summer, see what we're doing. Please, we like to take people for to walk the fields, see what's going on. Um, we even have a, 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 the back of our farm is a branch of the Walk Hill River. So we have the river right in the back going by. Oh, so we can take walks down the old railroad trail. And we do that. We bring the dog down there. She likes to go in the water. You can go fishing back there. Uh, it's really, it's a, it's a really beautiful area. And the nice thing about it has, it's remained an agricultural area. There's no development. We're really lucky because the soil up there, we're in New York's black dirt region, Orange County, and the soil is protected. It's 18 mm -hmm. to 20, I think about 20,000 acres of it, of which we have 25. And it's all protected. You can't build on it. Um, so so there, there's no developing going on. Most of the farmers there are all generational from Germany, Poland, and Italy. Most of them are from Poland, the farmers, um, uh, of, of Polish descent. And uh, some of them are Germans, and some are, so a few of them are Italians. But for some reason, the Northern Europeans gravitated to that region because it kind of reminded them of where they came from. Uh, whereas the, the, the Italian farmers tended to wind up down in Vineland because it's warmer, it's different. The climate reminded them of Italy. So they wound up in that area. Uh, so you have a lot of the farmers we deal with, they came in, in, in the 1880s is when they first started or the 1870s farming the area. So I'm dealing with everybody I work with or I know up there, all the farmers are multi-generational. They come from fourth, fifth, sixth generation of farmers on the same land. And uh, they're all good people. They're all uh, good neighbors. We all help each other um, and uh, we all work together. And uh, it's just, it's a lot of fun. You know, it's a whole different world. And it's not that far away. <laughs> it's not. It's 45 and, and 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 thank you so much, Tony. This was this was great fun, and I I oh, love good. Thank you show for and tell of, of the pleasure. tools, and we got so much information. So so I'm gonna say good night to everybody, and I think I'm gonna go shopping for the library. Okay, well, let me know, Lottie. I can help you if you want me to help you with that. I can help you. Yeah. It will do. Take care. Okay. Bye -bye. Thank, thank you, Tony. Good night. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Okay. Good night. Right. Thanks for being bye -bye. here. Bye bye. Uh.